That request is not all bad, but even the best-intentioned women cannot give what is needed. Some father-hungry sons embody a secret despair they do not even mention to women. Without actually investigating their own personal father and why he is as he is, they fall into a fearful hopelessness, having fully accepted the generic diminished idea of father. Quotation, I am the son of defective male material, and I'll probably be the same as he is. End of quotation. Then, with this secret, they give up, collapse, live with a numb place inside, feel compelled to be dark because the father's dark. They lose the vigorous participation in political battles, so characteristic of 19th century men in the United States, feel their opinions do not matter, become secret underground people, and sometimes drown themselves in alcohol while living in a burrow under the earth. Other sons respond by leaping up and flying into the air. Many contemporary sons do not fight the father as in earlier eras or figure out strategies to defeat him, but instead ascend above him, beyond him. We have transcendental psychology, the psychology of men like Thoreau, determined to have a higher consciousness than their fathers. Flying of that sort does not rescue the father either. The ascensionist son is flying away from the father, not toward him. A great theme in fairy stories is that there are two kings. Trouble happens with one's own father, the first king. Then one has to leave the castle. After some time of suffering and isolation, a second king somehow appears in the picture, finds the hero or heroine while hunting, adopts him or her, and sets a task. Then a complicated dance begins as the adventurer tries to establish a fruitful connection with the new king. We remember that the boy in our story having no craft, he shows some lack of father teaching in that detail, takes a job as a kitchen helper in a castle which is not his father's castle. Here he experiences soot and ashes, even though he still retains his golden hair. After some time in the kitchen, the cook gives him an order to take food to the king. The story says it this way. We are entering the story again. You know, on this planet, they're only night and day. In the place we're going to, there is a third state, neither night nor day. Once when it happened that no one else was at hand, the cook ordered the boy to carry food to the royal table. But because the boy did not want his golden hair to be seen, he kept his turbouche on. Such a thing as that had never happened in the king's presence, and he said, when you come to the royal table, you must take your cap off. The boy answered, Oh, Lord, I cannot. I have a sore place on my head. The king called the cook up, scolded him, and demanded how he could have taken such a boy as that into his service, and told him to fire the boy and get him out of the castle. This gold hair helps us to survive in adolescence, but it's more an intrusion than a help, and the boy in our story says it quite accurately. I have a sore on my head. Such hair is a taste of heaven, but we don't know what to do with it when we meet the king, whether to let it show and brag about it or hide it and be devious. Everyone wants to be with the king. We know how intensely young girls wanted to be in the presence of Elvis the king, or more recently to be near prince. The Dalai Lama acts out the king for many people now, for some replacing even the pope. The hunger for the father transmutes into the hunger for the king. But the story says that having golden hair doesn't give us leave to remain in his chambers. Perhaps each of us has taken some sort of kitchen job, got acquainted with the ashes, even endured a katabasis, but that doesn't mean we can have a long stay with the king. The guards let us in and escort us out again. That's what the story says. Visits to the king, even when we are young, do not last long. The alchemist would say that even though we have done good ashes work, the soul is still contaminated with infantile angers, unrealistic hopes, and rage at our parents or at ourselves. Another way to say that is that we know in the kitchen what we have learned from the senses. We know wood and fire and ashes, and that's it. Our soul, when it's in the kitchen, resembles some sort of crude or mixed rock. Spirit, being clarified and single, cannot make a clear impression on this crude stuff until later. The king, by contrast, who lives in his room high in the castle, among air and sunlight, suggests solar power and the holy intellect. 
The king has arrived at unity. He is undistorted, unmingled, as compared to the boy of ashes or the sooty girl, and he looks on matters differently. We should not be surprised if the boy's visit in our story is short. If the visit to the king's room is so important and so emotionally charged, we should look in more detail at what the ancient world meant by the word king. King and queen have a long and honorable history in the invisible realm of myth and fairy stories where the words do not imply human beings, let alone persons of gender as well as a long history in the visible realm of monarchy where they do. We'll distinguish among three kings, the upper, sacred king, the middle, political king, and the third, or inner king. There is a sacred king in the imaginative or invisible world. We don't know how he got there. Perhaps human beings, after having loved the political king for centuries, lifted him up into the invisible world, or perhaps it went the other way around. At any rate, there's a king in sacred space. From his mythological world, he acts as a magnet and rearranges human molecules. Whenever the word king or queen is spoken, something in the body trembles a little. The king and the queen send energy down. They resemble the sun and the moon that pierce down through the Earth's atmosphere. Even on cloudy days, something of their radiant energy comes through. These magnets or whirlwinds do things, are verbs. They affect our feelings and actions the way a magnet arranges tiny flakes of iron. The flakes move into a pattern. So a human being finds his or her feelings arranged in a pattern when in a room with the king. John Weir Perry calls the sacred king the Lord of the Four Quarters. The Lord of the Four Quarters sits with his queen, who is the queen of the four quarters. Neither king nor queen undermines the other's power. Both live in a mythological, eternal, and luminous realm, which we can call the mythological layer or the eternal realm. I would estimate that people in the West lost their ability to think mythologically around the year 1000, and then the layer collapsed. Perhaps because Christianity would not allow any new stories or new gods, or perhaps because after the Renaissance, the exciting pursuit of science absorbed more and more energy, the layer was never reconstituted. European men and women gradually stopped feeding the abundant gods and goddesses with their imaginative energy. The inner heaven collapsed, and we see all around our feet its broken glass. The gods are lying all around our feet. The king in our story, high in his chamber, represents this sacred and eternal king. He lacks a queen in our story, and we don't know if the storyteller lost the queen or if something is being said through the queen's absence. He does have a daughter, though, and she, with her great power, will become the queen later in this tale. By his presence in the story, the king indicates that the landscape around Iron John is an ordered space. It is a cosmos rather than a chaos. Earthly kings, as leaders of huge cities and empires, holding broad powers, are first noticed during the second millennium B.C. in the city-states of Mesopotamia. As principles of order, they began to fall in the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe under the title of Kaiser, Tsar, Emperor, Maharaja, Sultan, Bey. One after another, the kings fell all through Europe and then throughout its colonies. During the Middle Ages, kings would take tours of their earthly realms. Hundreds of people waited in English village lanes, for example, to see the king go by. They probably felt a blessing coming from the sacred king as the physical one passed silently by. The problem is that when the political king disappears from the lanes, even for good reason, we find it difficult to see or feel the eternal king. I am not saying that the king killing was an error, nor that we should resurrect the king and send him out along the lanes again, but we need to notice that our visual imagination becomes confused when we can no longer see the physical king. Wiping out kings severely damages the mythological imagination. Each person has to repair that imagination on his or her own. 
when the political or earthly kings lose respect, cannot do their work, lose their connection to the sacred king, become dilettantes or gods, are killed, vanish from our sight, then things change. The imagination has more to do. It doesn't do it. Our fathers then become lessened in our mind's eye. Now we also have inside us a third king, whom we can honor or not, and we'll call him the inner king. The inner king is the one in us who knows what we want to do for the rest of our lives, or the rest of the month, or the rest of the day. He can make clear what we want without being contaminated in his choice by the opinions of others around us. The inner king is connected with our fire of purpose and passion. When we were one or two years old, the inner king, we would guess, was alive and vigorous. We often knew then what we wanted, and we made that clear to ourselves and to others. For most of us, our king was killed early on. No king ever dies for good, but he falls over and dies. The process of bringing the inner king back to life, when looked at inwardly, begins with attention to tiny desires, catching hints of what one really likes. William Stafford describes that as taking in our fingers the end of the golden thread. We notice the turns of thought or language that please us. One remembers at 40 or 50 what sort of woman or man we really like. What were the delights we felt in childhood before we gave our life over to pleasing other people or being nurses to them or doing what they wanted done? The diminishment of the father and the collapse of the outer king makes the longing for the inner king intense, almost unbearable. There is some connection with addiction in this intense longing for the inner king. I would say that after the attention to tiny desires, the next step in developing the inner king begins not with resolutions, but with a long grief over the dead inner king, surrounded by his dead warriors. And the inner king, once recovered, requires feeding and honoring if he is to remain alive. And each man or woman has to figure out how to do that for him or herself. Now, there's a double stream inside the sacred king that we should also discuss. The sacred king in his upper room comes towards us with a shining face. He blesses, he encourages creativity, he establishes by his presence alone an ordered universe. But there is, as Robert Moore, the psychologist and theologian, has said so cogently and vividly, a second darker side of the king who curses young men, discourages creativity, and establishes by his presence alone disorder. If these whirlwind or hurricane beings are a part of nature, then we can assure ourselves that day will be accompanied by night, that plants will produce poisonous as well as healing substances. The sacred king sends his radiance down through the atmosphere, and the poison king, which is our name for the dark side of the sacred king, sends his radiance down as well. That means that in the political world, there will be a Herod as well as an Arthur. In Kafka's Metamorphoses, the son wakes one morning and finds he is somehow turned into a bug with a shell. We suspect the poison side of the great father is somewhere around. The insect son crawls under his own bed and lives there, exercising occasionally by crawling around in the living room walls while the father's absent. The father returns unexpectedly one day, and seeing the sun insect up on the wall, throws an apple that dents the shell and damages the sun's soft interior body. When the apple from the Garden of Eden hits the shell, we are out of psychological thinking and into mythological thinking. The father all at once carries something of a malignant Jehovah and a shamer on some fantastic, enormous level. The destructive father, or the poison father, does not give energy to those in his family, but draws it out of them, into some black hole he shelters in himself. He draws that energy out steadily, as the great tyrants we know of draw it from their citizens. Because of the tremendous hunger we each feel for the king, I mean the sacred or blessing king, we want to start living with him right now, 
We want to leap over our father and move to his place. But it appears we cannot move there until we have dealt with the axe father. To the question, why can't we stay longer with the king? We have to answer, children visit the king, but adults make a place where the king can visit them. We inquire then about the living space we have in our head for our own father. What sort of rooms have we made up for him? If we have the grudging, stingy respect for him suggested by the sitcoms, the chances are the room will be in a rundown neighborhood with a sagging door, plastic curtains, and a smelly refrigerator with rotten food in it, maybe small black dogs tied to the radiators. The son's first job, then, in a country like ours, is to redo that room, clean it, widen it, refurnish it, honor the father's clear and helpful side. The men who love their father simply and completely, and there are many of them, will find this work easy. Some men, of course, know consciously only the positive side of their father and don't have a clue about his dark side. Men with such an ideal father in their heads need to build an entire extra room for the father's twisted, secretive, destructive, vulgar, shadowy side, even if he was a hero to others. If we haven't made two rooms and furnished them, we can't expect our fathers, living or dead, to move in. Those men who have made both rooms inside their souls could begin to think of inviting a mentor in. He will also need two rooms. God also, it is said, is two sides. And God will surely never come to live with the person who hasn't made space in the soul for the king, for the mentor, and for his own father's blessed and poisoned sides. As we end this section on the king and the father with the image of an apartment that we need to make with uh, two rooms in which we invite our own father, and then we invite the mentor, and then we invite the king, and then we might invite God, we recognize that we've hit on something hard here. In the United States, the sons and daughters feel there is too little father, and that is probably not going to get better. Fathers themselves have not changed so much. It's rather that they seem to us smaller, because we do not see behind them or through them the blessed king or the destructive king. The father seems opaque, the sacred king seems farther away, and our eyesight is not too good. When the mythological layer collapses and the political kings fall, then the patriarchy as a positive force is over. The sun and moon energies can no longer get down to earth. Ancient Celtic mythology has an image for the end of the patriarchy, and this is how their image goes. Eagles sit on the top branches of the sacred tree, with dead animals beneath their claws. Rotting bits of flesh fall down through the branches to the ground beneath, where the swine eat them. We are the swine. When all the meat that comes down from above is rotten, then neither the sons nor the daughters receive the true meat. What is coming down through television is rotten meat. Women have been and still are right in their complaints about the food they find on this earth. But men are not well fed either. And my objection doesn't imply that we need to build up the patriarchy again, but that we need to understand that we are starving. The more difficult it is to visit the king, the more hungry everyone is. The perceived absence of the father is actually the absence of the true king. Men and women have been separated from the king before. This separation has apparently happened many times in past centuries. It'll be interesting to go back to our story then and see what happens next after the boy fails to visit the king for any long period of time. Now, we've come a long way already in this story of Iron John. What is left then? We can't stop the story here because, for one thing, the feminine has not appeared. The boy's mother, as the maternal form of the feminine, has, of course, appeared, but that's all. And now he's about to meet the feminine in a non-maternal form, in its powerful, blossoming, savvy, wild, instigating, erotic, playful form. She is the savvy woman on the earth plane. On the mythological plane, we could call her the woman who loves gold, or as some fairy stories call her, the woman with golden hair. In ordinary daily life, 
a boy meets the maternal feminine at birth, before birth, in fact, and it's a solid meeting or not, depending on the mother and her ability to bond. A man has many meetings with the feminine in grade school and teenage years. We meet the erotic feminine many times before we have actually taken the ashes road. Our story simply ignores these earlier meetings, for they, though sweet, are not it. For example, the relatively unconscious man at 24 years of age may have an affair with a relatively unconscious woman who is 24 and nothing happens at all. Usually both have less consciousness after the affair than they had before it. Our story is going to talk of a meeting with the savvy feminine that happens after the ashes, and the narrative implies that a fruitful meeting of that sort takes place only after the man has left the cellar and has gone into what we're going to call the garden. So we'll look now at how the story says this. We are leaving our time once more. You know, on this planet there's fire, earth, air, water. We're going now to the place where the fifth element is. You'll remember that the king had called up the cook and scolded him and demanded how he could have taken such a boy as this into his service, told him to fire the boy and get him out of the castle. The cook, however, had pity on the youngster and exchanged him for the gardener's boy. Now, the boy had to set out plants in the garden, water them, chop with his hoe and spade, let wind and bad weather do what they wished. Now, once in summer, when he was working in the garden by himself, it got so hot that he pulled his little head covering off so that the breeze would cool his head. And when the sun touched his head, his hair glowed and blazed out so brightly that beams of sunlight went all the way up into the bedroom of the king's daughter. And she leapt up to see what that could be. She spied the boy outside, and she called to him, Boy, bring me a bunch of flowers. Well, the boy quickly put his tarbouche back on. He picked some wildflowers for her, and he tied them in a bunch. And as he started up the stairs with them, the gardener met him and said, What are you doing bringing the king's daughter these ordinary flowers? Get moving, pick another bouquet, the best we have, all those uh, wonderful chrysanthemums. No, no, the boy said. The wildflowers have stronger fragrance, and they will please her more. Well, when the boy walked into her room, the king's daughter said, Take your head thing off, it isn't proper for you to wear it in my presence. He replied, I don't dare to do that. I have, I have a mange, you know. She, however, grabbed the tarbouche and jerked it off, and his golden hair tumbled down around his shoulders, and it was magnificent to look at. He started out the door to run, but she held him by the arm and gave him a handful of gold coins. He took them and left, but he put no stock in them. In fact, he brought the coins to the gardener, and he said, I'm giving these to your children. They can use them to play with. Well, the next day the king's daughter again called the boy to her and said she'd like to have some more wild flowers. When he walked in with them, she reached for his little hat and she would have torn it away, but he held on to it with both hands. Once more she gave him a handful of gold coins. Once more he refused to keep them and he gave them to the gardener as playthings for his children. Well, on the third day things went the same way. She couldn't manage to get his hat off and he wouldn't accept the gold coins. We know we are in the presence of something elaborate here. When the storyteller has the sunlight hit the gold hair, then bounce to the wall of the princess's chamber and from there into her eyes. And this garden scene is witty, astonishing, playful, serious, delighting in leaps. Many a man can remember meeting a woman who turned out to be faithful for his life in some such playful way. A telephone number falls out of a wallet, or he goes to the wrong restaurant, or he and she both stumble over the curb at the wrong moment, or they both choose the same book at the library, noticing it at the checkout desk, or the dog's leashes get entangled, or they get assigned the same task at some benefit and fight over who should do it. All these experiences of coincidence, simultaneity, serendipity, synchronicity, light, suggest that something is about to happen that belongs to or is part of the other world. We conclude, then, that this woman 
has some connection with the other world. All this began when the cook in our story assigned the boy to garden work. And you know what you do with ashes is put them in the garden. The word garden in mythological tradition suggests a walled garden. Garden suggests a place marked out, separated from farmyard, grain field, field or desert, in order that human beings can cultivate there precious plants or flowers. Entering the garden, we escape from the rain of blows offered by the world and find a temporary shelter. The walled garden is a place to develop introversion. The enclosed garden is also the right place for lovers. Thrifting lovers in medieval literature, Tristan and Isolde, for example, have their dangerous meetings there. Initiation asks every man at a certain point to become a lover, that is, to develop the lover in him from seed to flower. And we know that in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, for example, and other Renaissance accounts, it was not at all unusual for a young man at that time to take two or three years off and spend it learning to be a lover. We spend those years in graduate school instead. But the man learning to be a lover would learn how to play a musical instrument because the resonance of the strings affect the heart. He would learn poems by heart. He would practice setting them to his own music and then sing them to introverted women sitting behind iron window bars. This is garden work with longing in it. For us, garden work may begin unexpectedly. An illness that confines a sufferer to a room for weeks may be his enclosed garden. An accident may bring it on. Thoreau, on the other hand, chose to live for some months in a cabin he built himself, and he and his cabin and Walden Pond were his garden. He knew very well that he had become a lover, and he said, A match has been found for me at last. I have fallen in love with a shrub oak. Some men entering the garden begin by getting up at 5 a.m. and keeping an hour for themselves each morning before work. A father, in order to do that, may have to resist his own insistence that his life belongs to his work, his children, and his marriage. Making a garden and living in it means attention to boundaries, and sometimes we need the boundaries to prevent caretaking from coming in and occupying all our time. The boy in our story has met the king's daughter attracted to him by his gold hair. So we have called her the woman who loves gold. And she belongs to the mythological world. What would it be like for an ordinary boy to meet uh, the woman who loves gold? I remember a man telling me of a summer that he spent at 15 working as a busboy in a Catskills resort. He and the other boys were doing all right until one day a tall, blonde, beautiful, self-contained, high-cheekboned, 16-year-old girl walked into the dining room. The whole thing was over in a moment. The 15-year-old boy sank under the waves, bubbles came up, he was lost. It's interesting that neither he nor his equally moved friends ever talked to her. Instead, they spent hours after work discussing who spoke to her today, what she wore at breakfast, whom she walked up with, who sat at her table. Her face and its beauty, which seemed inaccessible or invulnerable, made them all feel like hicks, inarticulate clods of earth, hopelessly matter-ridden louts. She was above matter. For three weeks the obsession went on. They woke up every morning feverish. Then the summer ended. She left, and that was it. There was only one event in the summer, that one. The 16-year-old girl was not the woman with golden hair, but the boys didn't know that. They saw what they saw. They saw the track of the moon on the water. They saw the king's daughter. They were deliciously confused. The girl on her side is equally confused. She may in reality be lacking in self-esteem, be insecure, shamed, even victimized. But on the outside, in the radiance from her face, she is queenly, self-possessed, golden, invulnerable. The gold woman in the other world sends her radiance down through the atmosphere, and the radiance appears on the girl's face. Now, if the boys had been 18, one of them might have spoken to her and courted her. He might even have made love to her, and in the course of all that, he would have realized that she wasn't she. What a disappointment. When she asks him why he has lost interest, he may even tell her of his disappointment. 
we're looking at a source of a lot of desperation in certain men here and a lot of suffering in certain women. A man may repeat the courting and disappointment over and over. One man, about 35, told me that confusion about these layers had ruined his life. His life had gone like this. He sees a woman across the room, knows immediately that it's she. He drops the relationship he has, pursues her, feels wild excitement, passion, beating heart, obsession. After a few months, everything collapses. She becomes an ordinary woman. He is confused and puzzled. Then he sees once more a radiant face across the room, and the old certainty comes again. Her face seems to give out a whisper. All those who love the woman with golden hair come to me. She doesn't seem to realize she is sending out that whisper. Of course, the whisper gives her great power because men offer to rearrange their lives for her. But it isn't real power, and when men leave her, she feels insignificant and small, abandoned, powerless. A generation ago, millions of American men gave their longing for the gold-haired woman to Marilyn Monroe. She offered to take it, and she died from it. The glory of the sacred king drifts down to a public figure, a leader, and to a father who can receive it. The glory of the woman with golden hair drifts down from its eternal luminous space onto a public figure such as Marilyn Monroe or Meryl Streep and then to a 16-year-old girl in a Catskills resort. Underneath the invulnerable face is an ordinary human girl, highly vulnerable, being pulled up and down by these impersonal, ruthless forces. If an ancient Greek saw a man who had Zeus energy, he would never say, that man is Zeus. His mythology distinguished the layers. Now that mythology has collapsed, contemporary men again and again confuse a living woman with the woman who has golden hair. A living woman with a stomach, small intestine, and a disturbed childhood is not the woman of light. What does it mean when a man falls in love with a radiant face across the room? It may mean that he has some soul work to do. His soul is the issue. Instead of pursuing the woman and trying to get her alone away from her husband, he needs to go alone himself, perhaps to a mountain cabin, for three months, write poetry, canoe down a river, and dream. That would save some women a lot of trouble. The writer and analyst John Layard says that when a man is ready to make a decisive move towards his own soul, a feminine figure whose face looks both ways will appear in his dreams. It is as if this dream figure has two faces. One looks toward the world of rule and laws, and the other toward the world of dragonish desire, moistness, wildness, adult manhood, legends. This dream figure is not a flesh-and-blood woman, but a luminous, eternal figure. She is the woman with golden hair. The woman who looks two ways has appeared in our tale now. Iron John wants the young man to experience the garden. Once the garden, which may take ten years to develop, has been experienced, then we could say that the young man has begun to honor his soul. He has learned to become a lover, and he has learned to dance. The story will move faster from now on. So let's return to the story. We are leaving our time now. We are going to the place where the oceans are disturbed, not only on the surface, but far down, where all the birds have enormous peacock tails. Not long after the gardener's boy had met the king's daughter, the whole country was swept up in war. The king gathered his forces and was not positive he could succeed against the enemy who was powerful and retained a large army. The gardener's boy said, well, I'm quite grown now, and I'll go to war if you'll just give me a horse. But the other man laughed, and they said, When we're gone, you go look in the stable. We'll certainly leave a horse behind for you. When they had all gone, the boy went into the barn and laid a horse out. Well, it was lame in one leg, and it walked hippity-hoppity. He climbed on it, and he rode to the dark forest. 
When he came to its edge, he called three times, Iron John, Iron John, Iron John, so loud it echoed through the trees. In a moment, the wild man arrived and said, What is it that you want? I want a strong war horse because I intend to go to war. You will receive that and more than you have asked for as well. The wild man turned then and went back into the woods, and not long afterwards, a stable boy came out of the trees, leading a war horse that blew air through its nostrils and was not easy to hold in. Running along after the horse came a large band of warriors, entirely clothed in iron, with their swords shining in the sun. And the boy turned his three-legged nag over to the stable boy, mounted the new horse, and rode out at the head of the soldiers. By the time he neared the battlefield, a large part of the king's men had already been killed, and not much more was needed to bring them to total defeat. The boy and his iron band rode there at full speed, galloped on the enemy like a hurricane, struck down everyone who opposed them, and the enemy turned to flee, but the boy kept after them and pursued them to the last man. Then, however, instead of returning to the king, the boy took his band a roundabout way back to the forest and called Iron John out. Iron John, Iron John, Iron John, what is it that you want, the wild man said. You can take your horse and your men back and give me again my three-legged nag. So it all happened as he requested, and he rode the hoppity hop back home. When the king returned to his castle, his daughter went to him and congratulated him on his victory. It wasn't me, he said, who managed that, but a strange knight and his warrior band who arrived to help. The daughter asked who this strange knight was, but the king didn't know, and added, He galloped off in pursuit of the enemy, and that's the last I saw of him. The girl applied to the gardener and said, Where was your boy this afternoon? He laughed, and he said, Ah, he's just now arrived home on his uh, three-legged nag. The farm help made fun of him, and they said, Guess who's here? Moopy goop And then they said, You've been under lilac bush, huh? How was it? And the boy said back to them, I fought very well. If I hadn't been there, who knows what would have happened. And they all fell over themselves laughing. So it's time now for the warrior. It's time in the development of a man for the warrior to come in. Michael Mead reminds us of the old Celtic motto, Never give a sword to a man who can't dance. Our story says that the next step for the boy is warriorhood after the garden, uh, not before it. The warriors inside American men have become weak in recent years, and their weakness contributes to a lack of boundaries, a condition which earlier we spoke of as naivete. A grown man six foot tall will allow another person to cross his boundaries, enter his psychic house, verbally abuse him, carry away his treasures, and then slam the door behind. And the invaded man will stand there with an ingratiating, confused smile on his face. When a boy grows up in a dysfunctional family, perhaps there is no other kind of family, his interior warriors will be killed off early. Warriors mythologically lift their swords to defend the king. The king in a child stands up for and stands for the child's mood. But when we are children, our mood gets easily overrun and swept over in the messed up family by the more powerful, more dominant, more terrifying mood of the parent. We can say that when the warriors inside cannot protect our mood at three years old from being disintegrated or defend our body from invasion, the warriors collapse, go into a trance, or die. Each child lives deep inside his or her own psychic house or soul castle and the child deserves the right of sovereignty inside that house. Whenever a parent ignores the child's sovereignty and invades, the child feels not only anger but shame. The child concludes that if it has no sovereignty, it must be worthless. Shame is the name that we give to the sense that we are unworthy and inadequate as human beings. When our parents do not respect our territory at all, their disrespect seems overwhelming proof of our inadequacy. A slap across the face pierces deeply, for the face is the actual boundary of our souls, and we have been penetrated. If a grown-up decides to cross our sexual boundaries and touch us, there's nothing that we as children can do about it. Our warriors die, 
The child, so full of expectation of blessing, whenever he or she is around an adult, stiffens with shock and falls into the timeless, fossilized confusion of shame. What is worse, one sexual invasion or one beating usually leads to another, and the warriors, if revived, die again. I think it's likely that the early death of a man's warriors keeps the boy in him from growing up. It's possible that it also prevents the female in the boy from developing. We know that Dickens, for example, endured a horrendous childhood, and we also notice that his female characters tend to be sentimental and girlish. It's possible that these girlish beings are projections of his stunted interior woman whom his warriors could not protect from the violence all around him. The inner boy in a messed up family may keep on being shamed, invaded, disappointed, and paralyzed for years and years. I am a victim, he says, over and over, and he is. But that very identification with victimhood keeps the soul house open and available for still more invasions. Most American men today do not have enough awakened or living warriors inside to defend their soul houses. Women cannot defend their soul houses either. Most people do not know what genuine outward or inward warriors would look like or feel like. Psychologist and theologian Robert Moore has thought cogently and intensely about the warrior, and we'll sum up a few of his ideas about the outward or disciplined warrior. He emphasizes that for men, the energy of the warrior is hardwired. It is not software. He may say to men, you have plenty of warrior in you. Don't worry about it. More than you'll need. The question is whether you will honor it, whether you will have it consciously or unconsciously. The warrior's area of expertise and experience is the battlefield. The war that takes place there can be physical war, psychological war, or spiritual war. Inside that reverberating and ritual space, armies, tribes, divinities, even ideas arrange themselves in adversarial fashion. Flags go up, voices deepen, brains sharpen, urgency tightens muscles. Extroverted men in the warrior mode, like General Patton, imagine battle, steel on steel, the holiness of the battlefield. As holy to them as the black-seated field is to the farmer, they imagine that rushing in of adrenaline, personal combat, the delight of danger, even the joy of noble death. Moore emphasizes that the quality of a true warrior is that he's in service to a purpose greater than himself, that is, to a transcendental cause. Mythologically, he's in service to a true king. If the king he serves is corrupt, as in Ali North's case, or if there's no king at all, and he is serving greed or power, then he's no longer a warrior, but a soldier. When a warrior is in service, however, to a true king, that is, to a transcendent cause, he does well, and his body becomes a hard-working servant, which he requires to endure cold, heat, pain, wounds, scarring, hunger, lack of sleep, hardship of all kinds. The person in touch with warrior energy can work long hours, ignore fatigue, do what is necessary, finish the Ph.D. in all the footnotes, endure obnoxious department heads, live sparsely like Ralph Nader, write as T.S. Eliot did under a single dangling light bulb for years, clean up shit and filth endlessly like St. Francis or Mother Teresa, endure contempt, disdain, and exile as Sakharov did. We need to mention as well the sacred or holy warrior who lives in eternal space. The field for him, for the holy warrior, is the field of good and evil. Ancient literature, such as the Ramayana or Mahabharata, carries many more descriptions of these impalpable, invisible battles than of the battlefields in which human beings live and die. How can any complicated culture live without strong warrior energy? The outward warriors inside some women are today strong, sometimes stronger than those in men. Forces in contemporary society recently have encouraged women to be warriors while discouraging warriorhood in boys and men. We could say that the sacred warrior disappeared in our culture and the personal warrior as well. At Ypres in 1915, 100,000 young men died in one day, all of whom died without seeing the machine gunners who killed them. 
Anything left of the warrior vanished with the mass bombings of Dresden, the bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the B-52 bombings of rice fields in Vietnam. Contemporary war, with its mechanical and heartless destruction, has made the heat of aggression seem disgraceful. The Vietnam veterans suffered soul damage in that they went into battle imagining they served a warrior god and came back out of it godless. 